In the heart of the unforgiving North Sea, where waves rage and winds howl, there exists a kingdom like no other. Welcome to Sealand, a rebellious kingdom with a history as turbulent as the waters that surround it. This is the story of one man's audacious dream and his family's unwavering commitment to sovereignty. A pirate radio station, a principality's declaration of independence, a daring struggle for survival. Sealand has seen it all. But in August of 1978, Sealand faced a perilous challenge like no other. Under the guise of a business proposition, a group of Dutch and German men set foot on Sealand's shores. Little did they know, these men were highly trained mercenaries. This audacious act marked a pivotal moment in Sealand's history. A moment that would test the fortitude of this micronation like never before. But beyond the headlines and the intrigue lies a vibrant community, a microcosm of determination, and a symbol of human resilience. Join us on a journey into the heart of this rebel kingdom as we unravel the mysteries, challenges, and triumphs of Sealand. This is Sealand, the rebel kingdom of the North Sea. In a world filled with recognized nations, there exists a unique and often overlooked phenomenon micronations. These are political entities whose representatives claim to belong to independent nations or sovereign states, but they lack the legal recognition of any established nation. Micronations stand in stark contrast to the giants of geopolitics. They are not classified as de facto states, quasi-states, or even autonomous entities because they lack the legal basis in international law for their existence. While their activities may seem trivial, some micronations have issued their own coins, flags, postage stamps, passports, medals, and other state-related items, sometimes as a source of revenue. The motivations behind creating micronations are as diverse as the micronations themselves. Some engage in this unique form of nationhood for theoretical experimentation, political protest, artistic expression, personal entertainment, or even the pursuit of criminal activities. While the concept of micronations may seem recent, it actually dates back to the 1970s with significant influence from the International Micropatrological Society. Micronationalism saw growth in Australia in the 1970s and a micronations boom in Japan during the 1980s. With the emergence of the World Wide Web in the mid-1990s, micronationalism evolved. It transitioned from its traditionally eccentric anti-establishment sentiment to more hobbyist perspectives. This shift allowed for the rise of exclusively online or simulation-based micronations and led to the formation of intermicronational organizations and diplomatic summits. But among these unique entities, one micronation stands out. A rebellious kingdom in the middle of the North Sea, known as the Principality of Sealand. Join us as we explore the world of micronations and dive deep into the captivating story of Sealand. Welcome to Sealand, the rebel kingdom of the North Sea. Sealand Sovereignty In the wake of Sealand's declaration of independence, the tiny micronation faced a series of relentless battles that would define its struggle for sovereignty. Leading the charge was none other than Prince Michael, an unlikely defender of this unique realm. Prince Michael thwarted no less than seven armed invasion attempts, displaying remarkable determination and a resourceful arsenal of guns, Molotov cocktails, and improvised projectiles. As Sealand's fame grew, so did the challenges. The British government had become aware of Sealand's existence and its location just seven miles off the coast. This raised serious concerns. Eager to eliminate this unconventional neighbor, UK officials tasked the British military with removing Prince Roy and demolishing Ruff's Tower. British warships entered Sealand's territorial waters, escalating tensions. The British Navy made several attempts to capture the fortress, resorting to both force and deception. But Sealand held its ground. Prince Michael, a British citizen, even faced charges in an English court upon his return. The court's decision was a turning point. In a landmark ruling in November 1968, the court declared its incompetence in the case, stating that it could not exert jurisdiction beyond British national territory. This marked the first de facto recognition of Sealand's sovereignty. Years later, another incident unfolded when a ship ventured too close to Sealand's waters, resulting in warning shots fired from the fortress. Despite the severe prohibition of firearms in Britain, authorities took no action. 
These incidents served as a clear indication that Britain considered Sealand beyond its jurisdiction, reinforcing the principality's status as a unique and independent entity in the turbulent waters of the North Sea. The battles for Sealand sovereignty had tested its founders' resolve, but they had also cemented its place as a symbol of determination and autonomy. Building a new nation With the Declaration of Independence secured, the next challenge was even more monumental, building a fully-fledged nation. On the 25th of September, 1975, Prince Roy took a historic step by proclaiming the constitution of the Principality of Sealand. This foundational document laid the groundwork for Sealand's governance, setting the stage for its unique political and legal structure. As Sealand's identity flourished, it gave rise to national treasures. A stirring national anthem was composed, echoing the spirit of this resilient micronation. Stamps bearing Sealand's symbols found their way into collectors' hands, celebrating the rich history and vibrant culture of this unconventional nation. But Sealand went beyond symbolism. It minted its own currency. Gold and silver coins known as Sealand dollars, adding a touch of economic independence. And when it came to international recognition, the Principality of Sealand issued passports, a tangible symbol of belonging for those who had contributed to its formation and enduring existence. These passports weren't just documents, they were badges of honor, held by those who had played a vital role in shaping the destiny of Sealand. The journey from a wartime sea fort to a self-proclaimed nation was marked by determination, innovation, and a sense of identity that resonated with Sealand's inhabitants and supporters around the world. As Sealand continued to evolve, its unique culture and spirit continued to grow, making it a beacon of individuality in a world dominated by established nations. Coup d'etat in the summer of 1978, Sealand faced an ominous threat that would put its sovereignty to the ultimate test. A group of Dutch and German men arrived on Sealand's shores, ostensibly lured by a business proposition. But their true intentions were anything but businesslike, they were highly trained mercenaries. While Prince Roy was away, they launched a daring coup d'etat, taking Sealand by force. Prince Michael, the heir to Sealand's throne, fell victim to the mercenaries. They bound his hands and feet, holding him captive for agonizing days before forcing him onto a fishing trawler. After the trawler reached the Netherlands, Prince Michael seized the moment of opportunity and escaped, determined to reunite with his father, Prince Roy. Back in the UK, a plan was swiftly put into motion a daring rescue operation codenamed Operation Trident. Sealand's most loyal and highly trained citizens formed the legendary Sealand Special Unit. In a daring dawn helicopter assault, Operation Triton culminated in the unconditional surrender of the invaders. The harrowing events of this coup were vividly recounted by Prince Michael in his book Holding the Fort, providing the only true first-hand account of the rescue mission. The invaders, now prisoners of war, became the focus of international attention. Germany and the Netherlands petitioned for their release, initially seeking British intervention. But the British government, citing its earlier court decision, claimed no jurisdiction over Sealand. Prince Rory released the Dutch citizens, complying with the Geneva Convention's mandate to release prisoners after the war's end. However, the situation was different for the German citizen, who held a Sealand passport. He was tried on Sealand for treason and found guilty. Sealand's jail, located at the bottom of the North Tower, became his temporary home. In an unprecedented act of de facto recognition of Sealand sovereignty, Germany dispatched a diplomat directly to Sealand via helicopter. Prince Roy, keen to avoid bloodshed and grateful that lives had been spared during the counterattack, made the decision to release the treasonous German citizen. This diplomatic gesture underscored the resilience of Sealand sovereignty and marked a pivotal moment in its history. The coup d'etat had tested Sealand's mettle and showcased its determination to stand as an independent and self-governing nation against all odds. Extension of Territorial Waters In the fall of 1987, a significant maritime development set the stage for a critical test of Sealand's sovereignty. Britain, on the 1st of October, extended its territorial waters from 3 to 12 nautical miles. Anticipating this move, Prince Roy took a bold step the previous day. He declared the extension of Sealand's territorial waters to match Britain's, reaching out to 12 nautical miles. This strategic move had a crucial purpose, ensuring that the right-of-way from the open sea to Sealand would not be blocked by British-claimed waters. 
After all, Sealand was just approximately seven miles from the British shores. Intriguingly, no formal treaty had been signed between Britain and Sealand to divide up the overlapping areas resulting from this extension. Yet, a general policy of dividing the area between the two countries down the middle was informally assumed, respecting each other's territorial claims. Crucially, international law does not permit the claim of new land during the extension of sea rights. However, Sealand's sovereignty was grandfathered, safeguarding its status. While some nations might have tried to use this situation to subvert international law and claim all the territory of a smaller and less recognized nation, such actions did not materialize. Britain made no attempt to seize Sealand, and the British government continued to treat Sealand as an independent state, respecting its sovereignty. In the face of this maritime challenge, Sealand's unique status as a self-proclaimed and resilient micronation stood firm, affirmed by international norms and practices. Data and Disaster In the early days of 1999, a bold vision emerged on Sealand's horizon. A group of young American entrepreneurs approached Prince Michael with an audacious idea of the establishment of Havenko. Their plan, to create an internet server farm on Sealand, a sanctuary where users could operate free from the draconian censorship imposed by other nations. As the new millennium dawned, amidst the frenzy of the dot-com boom, contracts were signed, capital was raised, and Havenko became a reality. Sealand, along with bases in London and Amsterdam, would host this ambitious project. Infrastructure upgrades on a grand scale commenced, preparing to power the vast racks of servers and meet the logistical demands of this groundbreaking endeavor. Satellite and microwave links spanned the skies, connecting Sealand to the world. About 25 staff members from the US, UK, and Europe immigrated to Sealand, setting the stage for the launch of this groundbreaking service. Havenko became a global sensation, capturing the imagination of the world's media. However, as excitement reached its peak, cracks began to appear. Tensions surfaced between Sealand's royal family and Havenko's senior management, with disagreements over acceptable user policies. Havenko's founding CEO returned to the U.S., citing personal issues, and the project faced internal challenges. By late 2000, Havenko finally launched, but the media buzz that had once surrounded it had dwindled. The inaugural year saw turbulence, with Havenko's CTO leaving the company under acrimonious circumstances. In 2003, with dwindling resources and a shifting landscape, Havenko was disbanded. Then, in June 2006, disaster struck Sealand. A fire erupted due to an anomalous failure of one of Sealand's power generators. The blaze quickly consumed the generator room and spread across the entire north deck. RAF Wattisham dispatched a rescue helicopter, racing against the clock to evaluate one of Sealand's citizens. He was airlifted to a hospital, treated for smoke inhalation, and miraculously discharged on the same day. The Principality's good relationship with RAF Air Sea Rescue Teams, which had long practiced casualty evacuations from Sealand, proved invaluable. In the weeks that followed, a dedicated team of over 10 people embarked on the arduous task of clearing and repairing the damage wrought by the fire. In the face of adversity, Sealand had once again demonstrated its remarkable resilience and determination to weather the storm. Sealand Today Today, the Principality of Sealand stands as a testament to the enduring human spirit and a beacon of hope for those who cherish freedom, self-determination, and adventure. Sealand has evolved into a vibrant hub that brings together a global community, bonded by a shared philosophy. For nearly six decades, Sealand has cultivated a dynamic culture that has captured imaginations worldwide. Today, Sealand competes internationally in a growing number of sports. In recent years, Sealand has embarked on an exciting journey to explore innovative governance concepts. In recent years, Sealand has embarked on an exciting journey to explore innovative governance concepts. Sealand is harnessing cutting-edge Web3 technologies like blockchain to create a more transparent and decentralized government. This empowers individuals to actively participate in decision-making and position Sealand as a pioneer of fairer, open governance. Sealand has also earned the distinction of being one of the world's most environmentally friendly nations. A staggering 99.9% .9 of the electricity is sourced from renewables thanks to wind turbines and solar panels. All the water is harvested from rainfall in the Principality. 
As we conclude our journey through the remarkable story of the Principality of Sealand, we are left with a profound understanding, a testament to the enduring spirit of human determination and the pursuit of freedom. Sealand, a self-proclaimed nation born from the ashes of conflict, has evolved into a vibrant community that transcends borders, welcoming kindred souls from every corner of the globe. In the face of adversity, Sealand has stood strong, faced challenges head-on, and emerged as a symbol of resilience and innovation. We hope this documentary has allowed you to glimpse the unique spirit of Sealand, a place where dreams take flight and where the pursuit of freedom knows no bounds. As we bid farewell to the Principality of Sealand, we leave with a sense of awe and inspiration, reminded that in the pursuit of our ideals, we can truly move mountains. Thank you for joining us on this extraordinary journey. To the hearts of people around the world, may the spirit of freedom and adventure continue to thrive.